Only Roxana is here. Hi, Miss Roxana. Hi, Celia. Hi, Anastasia. Hi, dear Hello. teacher. Thank you. Great. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. It's a bit great. It's really warm here. I got to like the 90s Fahrenheit here in May. So I wasn't too happy about that. But other than that, it's okay. Wow. Oh, that's right. It's winter time in Peru, right? It's like the winter time. It's getting colder. The fall. It's fall. Oh, the fall. That's right. It's the fall. The yeah. Fall. Winter in like so July we are, or something. We are 27 or 30 degrees, something like that. Wow. Fall weather. So here in Puda is, I think is uh, for some people hot, very hot. But I think for me it's warm because we are 27 or 26, something like that. I think that's 80s or in Fahrenheit, 70s or 80s. Mm. I so you are in in summer, am I right? No, no. We are almost in summer. Technically, we should be starting summer in June. I would argue summer is already here. Uh, and it's mm. only May. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, we are in Florida. I'm like in South Florida. So we're in yeah. pretty hot here. So do you live near the beach? No. Well, like an hour, maybe 45 minutes. An hour. Something like ah, that. Ah, OK. Great. Good. We have uh, a person from Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she's hello. Saying, saying hello. Uh, Nancy is saying hello from Ecuador also. Yeah. Oh, Nancy. Yeah, Nancy's here. OK, I'm going to send the link. Some Teachers are asking for it, okay? So I'm coming back in some minutes. <laughs> sure, let's just start in five, five minutes a week. We start no slowly. Start okay. No problem. Hey everyone. Yes, does someone have the link? I think that um, Rasana went to get the link, but does anyone have the link to share? Yeah, I have it. I will share it. Great. Right now. I don't have it. I entered by the numbers in the Zoom, in the Zoom room. Okay, perfect. Hey, Carla is saying hi from Ecuador. Hi, Carla. Hi, Berta.
Okay, we have some people joining the meeting. All right. Welcome, everyone. So happy to connect with all of you today. Can you all hear me OK? Yeah, your audio is good. Oh, wonderful. I don't know, because I'm upstairs in my bedroom because my family is all downstairs, including my two very rambunctious children. So I just wanted oh. to like, not fight the family and just come upstairs to hopefully it'll be more quiet. Yeah, that's that's good. It's better. Thanks for for making a space to share your knowledge with all of us. My pleasure. Hope everybody is doing well and wrapping up their semesters successfully. If you are in the middle of wrapping up the spring or winter semester, depending on uh, what season you're in, we're in the spring semester here and we're almost finished. Oh. Ready to take a well-deserved break. Nice. <laughs> I think we are Ready, Miss Roxana, can you hear me? Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So everybody, thanks for being here this afternoon. This afternoon we have Dr. Anastasia Waja. Yes. Uh, with us, so I'm going to introduce her. Let's see. Uh, Dr. Anastasia has been in education since 2004. She's a senior instructor of English at INTO University of South Florida and an adjunct professor for the humanities and English departments, also at USF. She has a PH degree in second language acquisition and instructional technology and a master's in multilingual, multicultural education. Dr. Kawaja is the incoming chair of the TISOL International Membership Professional Council. Her current research engages with this education and breaking the binary understanding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through the exploration of language use. Dr. Kawaja has published in the Journal of Multilingualism, Multicultural Development, and has a few books, uh, chapters coming out in 2021 and 2022. So please, virtual applauses for Dr. Anastasia Kawaja. <laughs> Thanks, Anastasia, for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I hope everybody is doing well. And again, if you are like me, you are starting to wrap up your spring or winter semesters, depending where in the hemispheres in the world that you are. So I hope that when we do have a chance, we will all try to take as much of a well-deserved break as we can because I just wanna go ahead and start the talk by saying that, wow, it's been a year, hasn't it? Um, my talk today is not necessarily um, related to our um, very interesting teaching context that we've had to find ourselves in, but it very much can be uh, applied to virtual or face-to-face -face classrooms. In fact, uh, I had um, the um, samples that you're going to see today from my students uh, actually were derived from when we all were thrown online last March. So um, all of the things I'm going to be talking about can definitely be applicable for all of these things. All right, so my talk today is looking at teaching media literacy in EAP classes. And I'm really talking about this idea of deconstructing the messages and decentering 
singular perspectives. Let me see if I can change my slide. There we go. All right. So uh, a brief outline, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about uh, media literacy, uh, but we're really going to talk about what literacy is, uh, what is media literacy, and why uh, teach media literacy in the ESL, EFL bilingual context, and then how do we teach media literacy in these different contexts. Um, up front, I teach um, classrooms full of various uh, cultures, uh, various identities, various ideologies, um, so we're very uh, careful to make sure that all different perspectives and ideas are explored. And we can also agree that um, media definitely has an array of different perspectives, and it's very important to learn how to deconstruct them and to understand them. All right, so first of all, again, I want to go ahead and pay homage to uh, the teaching year 2020-2021, because as Leslie Nope says from Parks and Rec, a very popular show that ended a couple of years ago, but still one of my absolute favorite shows, there's nothing we can't do if we work hard, never sleep, and shirk all other responsibilities in our lives. Uh, so again, um, teachers, uh, educators, professors, practitioners, take a deep breath in, take a deep breath out. We are hopefully almost there ending our academic year. Uh, we are not meant to shirk responsibilities. We are not meant to never sleep. But of course, and I know that a lot of us have basically done just that. I hope that my talk today is going to help to alleviate maybe some of that never sleep and shirk the responsibilities as we delve into talking about media literacy. So the first thing I want to do is to show you this list here between 19th and 20th century learning content mastery and then looking at the difference we're looking at 21st century century learning process skills. And I want you just to take a moment and look at this list and look at the differences that you see here between what we're expected to do in 19th and 20th century and the 21st century. Uh, so what are some key words that pop out at you? Uh, between the 19th and 20th to the 21st century. And we're going to be talking about this with regard to how it, um, uh, how it relates to media literacy. I'm going to look in the chat right now. So does everybody see the two lists here? You can either unmute yourselves or just write in the chat. What are some key words that pop out at you between these two lists as very starkly different? What are we, ex new methodology, absolutely, yes. Good, I'm gonna go shut my door because my six-year-old just opened it. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Okay. Technology, yes, 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 technology, even before COVID, of course, we're expecting. Sorry, Anastasia, your audio was, uh, Anastasia, can you hear me? Your, your audio is muted. Oh, yeah, something okay. happened. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. now, yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, before, more teacher-centered, now it's more student-centered. Yes, yes, we're definitely putting the onus on our students. So we're going to talk a lot about that when it comes to deconstructing technology. Yes, the way we teach is different. Yes, absolutely. Uh, good, yes, absolutely, good. I wanted to draw your attention to the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet point from the bottom. And it says mastery through demonstrated, uh, mastery demonstrated through multimedia. Um, and of course, uh, students are uh, learning and then the a third bullet point down students learn to set criteria and to evaluate own work. And finally, the very bottom one students are active participants and contributors. And this all fits into discussing this idea of media literacy and the deconstruction process of it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try to block this out. Okay, good. All right, so if we look at this, and I think it's a bit blurry, my apologies for that. Uh, we look at this 21st century learning and we see this kind of intersection between foundational knowledge, humanistic knowledge, and meta knowledge. And so we start to see, of course, digital literacy is a part of that. 
cultural competence is part of that, creativity and innovation, problem solving and critical thinking, communication and collaboration. All of these things are expected. And I'm a very visual learner. So for those of you who are kind of like the list was kind of too much, this is kind of a nice visual of everything that we're talking about when we discuss what we expect not only our students to do, but also how we are expected to teach the information um, as, as, um, as many people have pointed out, the way we teach and the way um, uh, the, the, uh, the methodologies that, that we use and the approaches are different. And I also want to go ahead and point out too, that as we found ourselves um, online and we're not always face to face, having these different kind of intersections of foundational humanistic and meta knowledge, we have to implement different types of activities. We're not always going to be the ones lecturing in front of the students. And so this whole idea um, of 21st century learning fits really well into this online learning process as, um, as a lot of us have pro has pro probably found out this year. All right, there we go. Okay. So first of all, what is literacy and media literacy? So we know that literacy is, of course, the ability to read and to write, but media literacy is a 21st century approach to education. So it provides a framework to assess, uh, uh, excuse me, access, analyze, evaluate, create, and participate using uh, messages in a variety of form, forms from print to video to the internet. So media literacy builds an understanding of the role of media in society, as well as essential skills of inquiry and self-expression necessary for citizens of a democracy. And this is um, actually coined by the Center for Media Literacy in 2002. So again, literacy is the ability to read and write. Media literacy is the ability to read and to write and to access and to analyze and to evaluate, create and participate in the different media messages that we get. And again, media can be print media, um, uh, it can be video. Uh, nowadays, we have things like, I mean, in anyone know TikTok? My goodness, that's just a whole nother kind of black hole to go into with all sorts of information and ideas, uh, advertisements, etc. So media literacy is basically um, our ability to try to understand, deconstruct, and to create, and to understand what media is trying to tell us so that we can be participants in the media and not just kind of bystander consumers. All right. So it's really important to also remember that we need to change with the times. And so uh, we need to also incorporate like social media platforms and the media. And we also need to understand, and especially if you've been around the United States and um, some other countries, I speak from mainly the United States perspective here, when we say that um, widespread information, um, it's not all the same. And this was highly apparent um, during the um, uh, presidency of uh, the other guy that was in the office before President Biden was sworn in in January of 2021. All right, so I want to go ahead and show you a really effective image that I use with my students and I actually have an updated version of it. Um, this basically shows you that every piece of media is indeed subjective. And I have an updated link that I will also share with you in the chat. I just kind of screenshotted this one in case it wouldn't work, but let me see if it'll work. Um, as you can see here, there is, and this is kind of, uh, this, this is more of a, um, a uh, Western centric image. So you see we have AP, we have MSNBC, we have National Review, we have Time Magazine, The Economist. And so what this does, it kind of puts all the different media sources on some kind of chart. And in the middle, it goes neutral. And it goes neutral all the way out to seriously inaccurate, fabricated, nonsense, damaging public discourse. So it branches out. And so you can actually see that while you have some neutral um, uh, uh, sources, you move on to more complex analysis, opinion, fair persuasion, uh, selective, incomplete story, unfair persuasion, right down to propaganda containing misleading info. Yes, there are sources out there that are meant to mislead. And so it's really important to make sure that we understand how we consume and understand our media. And if I have, let me see if I get, let's see, can you still see my screen? 
let me see. If yeah, I, uh, I can see okay. your screen. Okay, let me see if I can. Do you still see my screen? Okay, here we go. All right, this is the media bias chart 7.0. This is the newer one. This was just updated as of January 2021. Do we all see this? Yes. Okay. And I will also share the link when I come back to the Zoom. Oops. I'll put this in the chat. There we go. All right, oops, close that up. There we go. All right, there's the chat and here we go. Okay, good. So you see here again, it's kind of updated. There's a lot more sources also available, but basically it shows you and it shows students as well that not all media sources are created equal. And so when we are working uh, with stories and we're looking at multiple perspectives on things, we always say, well, where are you taking your stories from? And if they are, for example, going to choose the daily cost um, or Jezebel or Counterpunch, they understand that, well, this can be an opinion of uh, a, a high variation in reliability, or if they're choosing the New York Post, they understand that it could be more high partisan right. And so the whole idea is not to um, dissuade them from using different sources or understanding them, just understanding um, where different sources lie on a certain continuum. Uh, let me see if I can go back to my... Uh, okay, there we go. I'm trying to go back to my uh, PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. All right. I'm getting so much better at this. When I first was trying to go back and forth between things, it was a disaster. All right, good. So what are some things that you notice about uh, the chart that I showed you? And again, the link is there. I will go back to it. Um, as you can see, basically, uh, not all media are created equal. Some media are actually created to mislead and misinform. And there are many, many sources. So my question to you is, uh, can learners outside of the West or other places use this source as a guide? If we're talking multinational, multilingual learners, um, could we use this source and how could we use the source? And I'm going to open the chat just to kind of see if anyone has any comments. And if not, I can move on. Okay. So a couple of things about deconstructing media. Once you understand that not media, all media are created equal, it's really important to make sure that we understand that according to the Center for Media Literacy, there are five core concepts. First of all, all media messages are constructed. So of course, if all media messages are constructed, guess what, they can be deconstructed. Um, and media messages are indeed constructed using a creative language with its own rules. And different, this is really important to understand as well, different people un experience the same media message differently. And this is why that chart has been so crucial, at least for the understanding for my students to understand that depending on your own perception, depending on your own ideas, depending on how you understand it, it could be completely differently understood by somebody of a different culture, even different language background. Um, and also uh, media have embedded values and points of view because every single media message is indeed subjective and most media messages are organized to gain profit and or power. So what, what are some ideas or thoughts uh, as we start looking at these five important key concepts of deconstructing media? I'm going back to the chat again. Any thoughts? Nobody. Yeah, right. people share your ideas on the chat. Participate. Yes, I do not. Again, I am a student centered person. I do not like to be the one always talking at people. Uh, I really like to have more of like a collaboration. But we can also wait till the end. That's okay too. All right. So there are five, and honestly, so I'm going to close the chat. And if there are any questions, please let me know and I'll open the chat up again. 
All right, so there are five key questions to ask. And the first is going to be who created the message? What creative techniques are used to attract my attention? So this could be celebrity. This could be the bandwagon technique. Usually this is done with commercials, but it absolutely can be done um, when you're looking at certain um, media articles as well, especially when they have political leanings and things like that. Of course, how might different people understand this message differently? And also, which goes along with number three, is what values, lifestyles, and points of view are represented in, <coughs> excuse me, or omitted from this message? Because it's impossible uh, to um, include all different perspectives and all different ideas. In fact, usually, at least for media creators, it's purposely left out so that you can center on one idea on one focus. It's really important to make sure that you understand what pieces are left out and what pieces are represented. And finally, why is this message being sent? Any type of media always has a purpose for being sent. It always has an agenda for being sent. And so that is, um, that is important to also remember. All right. And again, these are all these these all come from medialit.org. The questions, the five core concepts, these are all from medialit.org. All right. So we need um, to decenter um, in media literacy. And so in my class, we had the focus being on American media. Um, and ESL students. Um, learning media literacy have the opportunity to learn about uh, American culture um, because we mainly focus on American media. Now in their projects, I always uh, encourage them to go beyond and say, okay, now that you have a solid understanding of looking at American media, uh, let's go to your respective countries, look at different media there and kind of compare the techniques, compare the ideas because every single piece of media has their own um, uh, unique um, uh, types of ways to create, depending on if you're looking at a commercial or you're looking at even an article. So my question is, how can these ideas be repurposed to include a broader international audience? What are some ways in which we can deconstruct uh, core concepts of media globally? Anybody have any ideas or thoughts on that? Everybody is so quiet, but it's only what, 6 p.m., 5 p.m.? <laughs> they are shy. <laughs> okay, it is all right. We will hopefully talk at the end. But these are definitely things I want people to start thinking about and um, to discuss at the end and bring your questions as well and your thoughts. Okay, so why teach media literacy in the ESL, EFL bilingual context? And so I have some various ideas here. And so the first thing is it can help students with English acquisition using authentic texts. So a lot of times there have been complaints about, oh, but well, there is this book that they use, but they really kind of simplified the recording too much. And it's not really like authentic or, you know, they went and they, they uh, there's only a couple of paragraphs of this one article and they've taken so much out of it that the, the uh, point is basically gone. Um, there are different ways in which we can modify, um, mainly what um, in my particular class that I use this, um, this these uh, projects in is they are in our pathway uh, program, which means that they are concurrently taking a few college classes while they are still getting English skills with us at Into University of South Florida. Um, so then once they graduate from our program, then they're fully matriculated into their major. Um, so that's also it's important to understand that, but there are definitely ways that we can kind of level it um, instead of using, let's say, articles, you can use commercials and things like that. So there's definitely ways that you can modify depending on your level, but authentic texts are certainly the focus here. Um, and it also helps students to engage in critical thinking skills. Uh, it helps students to engage with multiple pieces of media because, again, the, the uh, call the 21st century learner is to engage with um, in uh, multimedia and to critically think with those pieces. It can also help students become critical consumers of media from multiple perspectives and possibly multiple cultures. So my whole point in trying to do this is to make sure that we try to decenter a singular perspective and say like, well, here's the way I understand it. 
And I really want students to understand, well, are there other ways to understand it? Are there other things that it's like, are, are there other possibilities uh, besides the one that maybe you're meant to go for, you're meant to understand? Because again, media is savvy. The creators of media are very, very savvy. And so and we have to be able to understand the message and be able to interpret it. So how can we teach media literacy in these contexts? And so what I did is depending on your age group, you can select different pieces of media. You can have students select media from commercial advertisements. Now we have YouTube. I mean, now we have TikTok. Uh, TikTok was not a thing, at least for me, until about a year ago. Uh, but I know it's been around for a little bit. And then you go through those deconstruction questions. You go through who created the message, uh, why is the message being sent, uh, how might different people understand this differently. Uh, you can compare different advertisements, what are the different techniques used. Uh, for my undergrads, uh, we moved to exploring how media is posted on certain social media platforms and the interaction between the participants. So when I first started this whole media literacy unit about maybe five or six years ago, we weren't really focusing on where the message was being posted in social media. We were focusing on the media itself, so the commercial or the article. So in this particular iteration of this project, we said, okay, you know what? This particular media is being posted on Instagram. This particular media is being posted on Facebook. This media is being posted um, on Snapchat. Right. So what so how um, how do people interact with it? Uh, what kind of text and what kind of images? Uh, so that was also kind of another kind of layer to this uh, media literacy deconstruction process. All right, so I want to go over just a brief media literacy project that I did with my students. But before I do that, I wanted to see if anyone had any questions uh, or any um, any comments before I move on. Yes, so if you want to talk, if you want to participate, if you want to activate your microphone, just let me know. Oh, Evelyn is writing something on the chat. Oh, perfect. Oh, I see. Yes, teaching using media uh, helps students to learn the real language involved in the culture and help and discuss a lot of the topics, politics, environment, or any social problems. Absolutely. Anastasia, I have yes. a question. Sure. So we're completely sure that uh, media literacy is is popular in developed countries, you know? Do you have any research about media literacy in undeveloped countries or where students don't have opportunities? Is it in, increasing, decreasing? Are there barriers to sure. media literacy? please sure so depending on what country context you are and i've um i was speaking to a group of teachers uh in oman um i guess maybe three four months ago and this question was also brought up and so um and there was also a, an um uh the topic led to sensitivity of issues so for example for me i brought up politics and i know that in some places said what if we can't talk about politics and i said well then don't talk about politics um, it's, but it's definitely a way to try to explore different uh, media concepts and just to understand how media is being used to spread information. Uh, depending on um, maybe uh, class comfort or even uh, university or school rules, maybe you just want to, maybe you want to talk about, I mean, the environment is a really hot topic. Um, you can talk about, I mean, even something simple as a clothing advertisement. Um, I know that um, uh, differently, maybe like a shampoo commercial, uh, things like that. So you can definitely start. You don't have to get right into the um, uh, social issues. You can start very small, um, but they will still be able to use these skills. They'll be they'll still be able to see how um, whether how media is created, and then they'll be able to extend that knowledge to different ideas. Like um, Evelyn said in the chat here, politics, environment, or social problems. Uh, it definitely is important, though, to make sure that where um, uh, whatever the standards are, wherever you are teaching, they need to be respected. Uh, and I know that's different uh, in um, in every part of the world, and even honestly, in the United States, uh, even uh, even um, uh, certain schools, like elementary schools, high schools, middle schools, versus uh, the standards of the university. 
I have a lot more leeway to discuss things with my students that I probably would not be able to discuss in the school system just because of um, the age and the school rules, et cetera. Um, but it's definitely um, applicable uh, in any kind of level that you would want it to be, uh, just to be aware of your surroundings. And um, yes, I hope that helps to answer your question. Um, oh yeah. All right, so I wanted to um, go over just a very quick uh, procedure that I did with my media literacy project. And so what I did, and I actually had to move this more to an online forum where they had to record their presentations and then post them in discussion board and everybody could comment. But you can also do this face to face. It's very effective face to face right in your classroom. And so I have a procedure where they present uh, where um, there's a presentation of the explanation and analysis of the video using media literacy strategies. And so they have to use a PowerPoint or some kind of other visual aid. Uh, I know that there is something called Loom where you can actually record your voice and the, um, and the um, images simultaneously. Uh, you need to show at least a uh, two or three different ads or advertisements. Uh, give the uh, context of the entity. So you either have a video advertisement, you can have a commercial advertisement, you can have an article. Uh, find at least two to three messages on various social media platforms and analyze them by answering as many of the questions that are relevant. So, for example, when you're looking at the deconstruction questions, uh, maybe not all of them can be answered for all the different types of media that you're choosing, but at least you're able to start looking and exploring uh, this different idea. Rather, these different ideas that the social media or rather that the uh, media pieces bring out. And so the general question that I have and they're following is say, what is the overall effect of social media on this entity? So I said, where, so I said, so um, I'm going to show you some samples of what my students chose. A couple of them chose uh, more social justice um, type of things and a couple chose uh, topics like um, shampoo or car ads. And then they also had to lead a discussion. Uh, where they had to collaborate uh, with their partner to lead a discussion about five to ten minutes uh, and then um, ask questions about the messages, how they're communicated, about the role of social media. And so having that Q&A portion, which of course for the online, when we were put online, they had to do this on um, the discussion board, but when they're face to face, they have to be prepared to answer questions um, about their uh, media literacy project. And so first was the presentation. And then they have a discussion leading portion. The really, the part that I found probably the most unique about this particular presentation is that they had to use the feedback from their classmates to write a final synthesis. So after they did their presentation, after they led their discussion, then they had to incorporate their classmates ideas into their final presentation write up. So they got a chance to put their team project findings and the peer perspectives together to see maybe if talking with talking to their peers, their perspectives changed how they changed, or maybe if they stayed the same. But I always one of my biggest pet peeves, I think, um, uh, especially in different classrooms is um, when they're doing a discussion leading or when they say any questions and nobody has any questions. Nobody wants to be that person to ask their friend or colleague a question. So to hold them accountable and say, no, you have to ask questions because you need to be able to use that feedback when you're doing your final write-up. So by asking a question, you are helping your peers to do their, to do their final write-up, which is the final part of their whole presentation. So I wanted to show you um, a couple of samples and I see a couple of questions in the chat. Let me just check really quickly. Oh, okay, the question is what happens uh, with students who are beginners? So how can we help them in Spanish, English or all English? So I am a huge believer in using all language resources you can. Uh, if they are now from a particular context, though, uh, we have a classroom where we might have seven different first languages. And so English is the only one uh, that is going to unite us. But I always um, try to uh, incorporate if somebody needs to translate something. Uh, we try to stay in English, but of course, if they're beginners, 
um, a lot of times what I find is that a lot of students can understand a certain concept in their first language. And I use that. I use that background knowledge to say, okay, you understand this in your language. And then we just tr try to start pulling English vocabulary to try to bring closer understanding. Um, but I am a huge believer in uh, making sure that all different languages are used uh, in order to get that acquisition process. Because um, when you're looking at English acquisition or language acquisition together, um, it is much more of if anyone has any ping pong balls, they try to submerge them in the water. Um, it's not so much, oh, I'm going to use English. I'm going to turn the light on. Okay, now I'm going to use Spanish. Okay, I'm turning the English off. When you have multiple languages in your head, it really is ping pong balls popping up uh, randomly at different times. And so sometimes you can't just utilize one language. In fact, it's almost impossible. So using all language uh, available is just going to help you in the acquisition process. All right, so I wanted to show you what this, so my students decided they were going to look at uh, the World Health Organization and Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry. Yes. That's okay. That's okay. So my students looked at, so this one particular group of students looked at the World Health Organization and uh, the coronavirus response. And again, this was a hot topic. They, they did these presentations in April. So we had all kind of been rushed back home in March. Uh, and so the first source was an article. It was a news article from The Guardian. And they looked at who created the message, techniques to use to, to attract the reader's attention, how different people understand the, the, the message in different ways. And so they, they, they analyzed and said, well, you know, in The Guardian, uh, well, here's the World Health Organization. Well, how do people understand the World Health Organization, um, especially here in the United States, when uh, the particular uh, guy in the White House did not particularly like the World Health Organization. Uh, but definitely in other parts of the world, that's that, that opinion was not shared by other world leaders. Uh, and then what they did is they said the first source and then the next source was a cartoon. Uh, oops, sorry, we'll go back here. They wanted to make me laugh. And so here is a cartoon that, that was created by the World Affairs blog. And this is, of course, uh, Trump. And it's, a, and it's just a funny cartoon. It's a quick, I need someone who I can blame for mishandling the coronavirus thing. Who? Perfect, thanks. Uh, so, uh, and so they talked about how um, uh, who created it, um, what the message was, how different people might understand this message depending on their perception of uh, Trump, um, and looking, even delving into a little bit of that propaganda uh, issue. And so their presentation on, the, on um, all these different uh, sources were absolutely excellent. And then, so they talked about, and, and then of course had a question that they asked the audience and said, do you think that who is doing their job regarding COVID-19 using social media? Um, if you were in the who, what are things you would change regarding the social media of the who? And so they analyzed and said, are these effective ways to message? You have the Guardian, and it was of course posted uh, by the World Health Organization. Then you have um, a, a comic that was also part of the World Affairs blog. And so they can kind of see how these different interactions are taking place on different social media platforms. Uh, again, this was a hot topic. This was hot off the press at the time, only a couple of months old. So this particular group decided to go into very, very, to very, to a very current event and explore how different people around the world are understanding the message of the who and trying to understand how the who is um, putting their message out to the world. And they also looked at similar differences between the sources. Um, and then the, con the, the conclusion was that the group thought in, uh, in general, collectively, uh, social media affects a lot on this type of information because a lot of people um, uh, let information uh, uh, go around the internet. And um, a lot of groups may not actually know the information. Uh, they may not even know if it's correct or they just might share their or, or, or um, spread the wrong data to others. Uh, in the in the presentation itself, they actually analyzed a couple of the comments that were coming from social media on these two sources. Um, and so they concluded that there's similarities, there's differences, but people have to be very careful to make sure they understand the information they're spreading and to understand uh, what they're reading. All right, another one, um, I had a group of students uh, go and uh, compare different advertisements of Nike. So one was a YouTube ad for Nike, 
And then the other one was, I believe this was Instagram. This was um, uh, an Instagram uh, advertisement for Nike. And it talked a little bit about the differences between using YouTube for an advertisement and for Instagram as an advertisement. And the questions that they um, had up for discussion for, this, for the uh, different classmates were, uh, do you think Nike succeeds in its campaigns on social media? And then it also led to, well, are you more likely to shop online or at a physical store? Do you consider yourself a person who buys a specific product that you saw in an advertisement? Uh, and so allowing students to kind of delve deep into, well, you know, how would you buy, uh, would you buy it online? Because they're seeing these messages online. Would you buy it at a physical store? Um, so like, in, in other words, does seeing this um, message on Instagram make you want to just go online and buy it online? Or does it make you actually go physically to a store to go and purchase it? Now, of course, again, this is a time of COVID. Uh, a lot of malls are being shut down. And so physical shopping was, of course, not an option at the time, but it definitely was a question that they brought uh, to the classmates for reflection. All right. Uh, finally, another group looked at Amazon and they wanted to see the influence of celebrities increased product awareness. Um, and so they looked at how Amazon um, used their uh, advertisement and they actually concluded that, you know, social media is a good platform to promote a company's idea, but it also brings some Trump troubles to the company. Uh, and they analyzed different uh, uh, customer comments, uh, pointing out existing problems, uh, causing crisis of confidence, and then also a loss of customers. Gone are the days of um, uh, companies giving reviews now anybody can give a review on a company, on a product. Um, you have Yelp and you have Reddit, but you also have the actual sites of these areas. And so they analyzed um, uh, how the customers themselves can actually hurt um, uh, customers on social media platforms and they will use their, um, uh, their uh, um, opinions and their persuasion skills. Uh, and they also looked at language of persuasion like scapegoating and the big lie, uh, et cetera. And so this was good um, to delve into and to look at. And the couple of questions that they posed to the students were, do you think that social media is better for a company or worse for a company? If you're the CEO of Amazon, would you choose social media to promote your company? Why or why not? And so this actually um, uh, led to a very uh, lively discussion um, on discussion board. And actually, as we met face to face, students were also able to comment and to talk about some of the different presentations that really stuck out the most to them um, after they participated in the discussion board activity. All right. And then finally, um, one group looked at uh, the influence of social media on uh, Tesla. Uh, and so they looked at a podcast, they looked at CNN, um, and they um, looked at, of course, an actual, this was um, uh, Instagram, uh, Elon Musk, and looked at the influence of social media on an actual Elon Musk tweet versus just the Tesla company uh, and saw what types of um, effects that that had using Instagram, using um, Twitter, using these different things, using Facebook, uh, and then questioning whether or not what is propaganda and what is not. So is this propaganda, um, uh, the, the, the influence of social media, but is, is this propaganda? Um, and then finally, um, student had some final um, synthesis selection. So at, at the end, when they did their presentations, and of course they had their um, discussions, they had to, as I said before, incorporate student ideas um, uh, rather peer ideas into their final write-up. And so here are just a couple of different excerpts here. It says, overall, all the feedback were positive and our classmates supported the position that we put forward in this presentation. It was really interesting to listen to new ideas, such as keeping cars in the malls and attracting customers. And so it talks about, it was interesting to look at ideas um, and try to incorporate them. And the other part says here, to conclude, the group agrees with the opinions given by our classmates as well as our colleagues. We acknowledge that Instagram nowadays has a higher rate of impact on customers. During the class discussion, uh, it was possible to notice different points of view about the same topic, even though we had the same opinion as the ones who contributed to the debate. 
And so they were looking at how, you know, even as a group, they had shared the same opinions, but then looking at different points of view, even within the classroom was really, really helpful. Uh, so it was another way that they were able to see different perspectives on the idea and really see this deconstruction process at work. So I really like these media literacy projects because it doesn't just stop at, okay, guys, or um, everybody, folks, we are going to uh, deconstruct this piece of media, then we're going to present it to the class, and then we're going to ask questions about it. But by opening themselves up to the opinions and the ideas of their classmates, guess what? The deconstruction process continues because there are people in the room that understand this media uh, differently. There are people uh, that are going to have um, uh, uh, different takes, different perspectives on it. And so we also talked about how the deconstruction process doesn't stop. Um, and it's another extension to understanding um, different opinions and different ideas. All right, so, um, so I had a couple of just various different types of questions from various people over the past times that I've given this talk in different parts of the world. Uh, one of the questions was that, can this be adapted for beginners? And you can absolutely start with images and possibly some discussions in your L1 um, and then moving on and putting in English vocabulary here and there uh, whenever you uh, or however you see fit. Um, again, the whole idea is different perspectives and, you know, of course, using English, but of course, if English is not fully, fully available to you, use what you can. The most important thing to do is to really activate those critical thinking skills. Um, can this occur when some countries do not have as many technological capabilities? And um, the one thing I can say is absolutely deconstructing and, de and decentering does not necessarily mean you need technological platforms. Um, you can also, and um, there were other avenues of looking at um, uh, different student presentation platforms like Padlet, uh, Inchwing, uh, and there's also different types of platforms that offer um, school subscriptions like Time Magazine, uh, et cetera. And so you can actually look at some of these articles and look at the comment section that can start the deconstruction process. Uh, you can also deconstruct well-known speeches uh, depending on um, uh, what your country context is. You don't have to just start or just stop with different um, uh, uh, commercials and things like that. Uh, I also talked about the dangers of taboo topics and making sure that you just understand where your limitations are. And that's completely fine. Um, you know, we're not, um, I'm certainly not advocating to change the world and to go be a social justice fighter and talk about everything that could possibly make you lose your job. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but, um, you know, as I said, a couple of my students actually brought up things like the World Health Organization and coronavirus, and that was their choice to bring that up. That was their choice to bring that in. Uh, it was their choice to bring a Trump cartoon into their presentation. Um, but again, knowing your limitations is going to be really important depending on where you're teaching. So analyzing media texts can help to hone those critical thinking and problem solving skills. Um, watching videos, listening to podcasts, reading newspapers, online articles. And again, this also helps to mix up the um, reading the book and the rote learning and different things that um, past ESL teaching has taught us to do. And this also helps us to be able to empower our students and for students to be able to be more uh, centered in the classroom, to be able to make decisions, to be able to uh, deconstruct these uh, different ideas and topics. Uh, and I wanted to also bring, um, here we go, let's see if I can, oh, it worked, excellent. Uh, this is an excellent source, it's um, called, well, well, I spoke too soon. No, it works, okay, good. Uh, language of persuasion. This is an excellent source. This is by no means an exhaustive list. This is just a basic list that I use with my students. So looking at how language of uh, persuasion is used in media. So looking at things like the bandwagon, ads showing that everyone's doing it, everyone's enjoying this product, you need to too. The beautiful people. Uh, sometimes advertisements only show the good looking people and hey, you can use this product and be beautiful like this or um, or the beautiful people will like you if you use this product. 
uh, uh, bribery, free gifts, sales, special offers, contests, sweepstakes, all these different things. Uh, celebrities is a big one. Wow, this celebrity uses this product or endorses this product. This, this means it's going to be important uh, to use. Uh, the experts, right? Um, I'm not just an actor. If you see some of the, um, uh, uh, the old commercials that said like, you know, this person is an expert, this person's not an actor. Uh, but this person is probably being paid to also bring this um, uh, product to the forefront as well. Um, and fear, of course, right? There's also the idea of fear of, oh my gosh, if you don't use this, if you don't buy this car, you could die in an accident. If you buy this car, you'll be able to be safe because this car has this kind of safety rating. This other car does not. Uh, and also humor, you know, humor is also very, um, very effective for people uh, to buy products as well. So there's all these different um, types of um, language of persuasion techniques that go from the beginner to the intermediate uh, to the um, uh, absolute more advanced. Uh, and depending on the level of your students, you can certainly uh, go as deep or as uh, surface as you need to with some of these. Go back to my talk. Okay, there we go. All right, so this is my contact information. Uh, these were my ideas regarding media literacy, and I'm certainly looking forward to an engaging discussion. I uh, hope you all took notes, and please, let's let's talk. Let's have a discussion. Nice. Yes, if anyone wants to to get their microphone activated. Yes, or you want to say something to Dr. Anastasia? Oh, Anastasia, your presentation was very clear. I think everybody has understood what is media literacy. And we can start, we can teach using it since the very, very beginning level, little by little. And as you mentioned in one point, well, we don't need expensive platforms. We have to adapt to every resource that is using media. Maybe teachers can write comments on the chat, Celia, and you can read to Anastasia. Mm, they want uh, they want the information. Information. I mean, maybe the the presentation. I don't know. Oh, sure. Uh, information or or do you need the link from the PDF that I uh, shared? I they can say, can you share the information, please? Uh, maybe they are talking about the presentation. I'm I'm not sure. I'm happy to share. Oh, the PowerPoint. Sure, sure. Oh. Yep, absolutely. And I will also share this as well. Um, let me go back here again, and there we go. I'll also share the PDF as well uh, that is here. At least then, and Anastasia, Celia, and dear teachers, last Saturday we started this 2021 fall workshop, and we started with Mauricio Arango and Miss Billy Rivas, who is in this presentation, and we learned a lot of things to be used using media, and they they are so practical, functional, uh, and easy for me because you know we are using a lot of media these days, especially people who haven't used it before, <laughs> and they show a lot of questions where the students use critical thinking, tongue twisters, uh, uh, freaky. I don't know how to say catchy questions. So I don't know, but and they both of them have used media. And yesterday we worked with Ailil Coutinho, and with your presentation, we have clear what is how important is media literacy these days. Yes, absolutely. Um, are you asking? How important is it? Or no, I, I'm reflecting. Oh, according okay. to your presentation, the, yes. the ones that we have on Saturday and yesterday, yes. and Mauricio, Billy, Ailil mentioned and use media literacy. 
to teach our students, you know? We are, we are not using books, we are using platforms, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. Yeah. And the students, I think, are, I think they are going to learn a lot, definitely. I agree. And honestly, now, you know, there are so many different like apps. You can have the Instagram and Facebook, all the apps are here. And, you know, even delving into things like TikTok, um, you don't need, as Rasana said, you don't need expensive platforms in order to do this deconstructing of media literacy. And the thing I love about this so much is that I've been doing these different types of projects and different iterations of this project for a while, but the media is always changing. There's always new stories. Everything is all, you can always just, there's always something else that is going on to look at, to understand. Uh, so this doesn't ever really get old, uh, which is also great. And again, um, you know, it's, it, it's a very, I think that ESL is moving into more innovative ways to use language. And I think that, and I hope that we're moving away from English only, this whole English only idea. Uh, which honestly, when I did my master's, that was kind of the philosophy. It was English only, don't use any other language. And then you start getting into more linguistic theory and I say, actually, no, you need to have every single possible language at your disposal, because that is going to help to further your English acquisition process. It'll help in your critical thinking skills. It'll help you to make these form meaning connections, which are so important. So um, doing activities like this uh, help also to um, go more with these uh, more innovative theories. Um, that's always helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for all the ideas that you have given us. Absolutely, it is absolutely my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me again. Yeah. Uh, I would love to come on to Peru Tech and I hope that um, with COVID, uh, I, I hope that when the restrictions are gone, I hope that I can visit Peru again. It's a wonderful country. I've enjoyed my time the past few times I've been. Uh, yeah. So I really hope that we'll be able to see each other face to face in the near future. Sure, that would be awesome. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Peru, Anastasia. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Absolutely. You know, it have was to... very clear, believe me, because I thought uh, about the topic and thought, oh, but now it's clear. And I think it's for teachers too. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks so a lot. lot. Thank you. <laughs> so don't forget everybody that tomorrow at Miss Roxana is eight o'clock, right? Eight o'clock with eight Mr. David White. David White. So we have Mr. David White tomorrow at eight o'clock. Okay, and yeah, thanks Anastasia. The people are saying thank you. They are very happy with your presentation. So hope to see you in another opportunity and hope to see you in Peru. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you all so much. And again, please feel free to reach out. Um, oh, you can also follow me on my, my Instagram. Ah, nice. Okay, well, this is my Instagram if anyone wants to follow me on Instagram. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Celia. Thank you, dear teachers. Thank you. We know you just finished working and you connect. Yeah. You, yeah. Are, you are connected to this webinar. Yes. Well, I know after a long day of teaching and we're all here together, that is dedication. Yeah. <laughs> Teacher, never stop learning. Absolutely. Even Set. with COVID. <laughs> yeah.